Thank you. Uh, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'd like this to be as interactive as possible. I don't want to be talking for an hour and 30 minutes uh, without having any idea if you're getting uh, what I'm talking about. So don't hesitate to interrupt with, uh, with questions. Uh, I have a lot of material, but I'd rather go through less and that we all interact than uh, throwing a bunch of slides at you. Um, Okay, before, before I get started, I just wanted to, I mean, some of you may be aware that today is a strike day in France for public, uh, edu I mean, higher education and research. Uh, so I'm not on strike because I thought my voice was better used here discussing science, uh, but I support the strike, so this is also something we can talk about afterwards, maybe. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's talk about science. Um, the, maybe I can move uh, somewhere, I can see my slides here. Um, the type of problems I'm interested in uh, can be summarized in the following way. Uh, you have data that's uh, genomic data that's been measured, I'm keeping it very generic, that's been measured on a number of samples. And those samples have also been phenotyped. So here I have a case control study, so I have samples that are orange and samples that are blue. Uh, and I'm trying to understand which are the features or the measurements along those genomes that explain uh, why some of those samples are orange and the others are blue. Uh, so those genomic measurements, they can be of many different types. Uh, so you can measure uh, protein expression, mRNA expression, SNPs, methylation sites. Um, what all those data have in common is that you there you have a lot of measurements. So you have uh, hundreds of thousands or millions or more of, um, of features, so measurements along your genomes, and you typically have much fewer samples. So uh, I work in mostly in complex diseases. Uh, you're happy if you have a few thousand samples in your data set. Um, and so the type of problem you have here is that you're trying to do inference on data where that's very high dimensional with low sample size. So that's something that uh, people um, uh, sometimes call large P, small n data, where P is your number of features, your number of measurements on the, sequence, on the genomes, and n your number of samples. Um, okay, so this is not big data. Uh, this is not big data for two reasons. Uh, the first one is that the type of data I'm talking about uh, very often fits uh, in uh, the memory of my laptop that's here, which doesn't qualify as big data. And the other res reason is this um, high dimensionality with low sample size uh, is something that people sometimes refer to as fat data by opposition to big data. So big data is lots and lots of samples. If you put your data in a data matrix where each line is a sample and each column is a feature, the type of big data that we hear a lot about in the uh, um, machine learning community and the news and uh, all those deep learning, whatever, uh, tends to be this type of big data where you have lots and lots and lots of samples. Uh, so millions of images or text documents or whatever. What we're talking about here is the data matrix is the other way around. There's much more features than samples. And this causes a number of problems, and this, uh, you can't really address this, these problems in the same way as you address those. Okay, um, so to illustrate why this causes problem, I've uh, run a few simulations. Uh, so here I've simulated large piece small n data, where I have 150 samples and 1,000 features. So I have one order of magnitude more features and samples. I would actually be happy if my genus data was like that. Um, and I've chosen 10 of those features to be causal in the sense that uh, I've created a phenotype that's a linear combination of those 10 features and then, so, then, and then there's some noise. So what this means is here I have my thousand features um, and what you see on the y-axis is the coefficient associated with this feature in this equation. 
uh, in this linear model. So what you see is that like there's 10 points that are orange. This is the features that have a non-zero weight, and most of, most of the other all the other features have a weight of zero. Um, okay, so here I'm simulated features like I'm like very simply, it's like normal distribution. I'm drawing them independently from each other, so they don't really look like biological data because they're not correlated. And uh, uh, but I'm trying to make my life easy. Uh, and I'm also making my life easy by simulating a phenotype that's a linear combination of 10 features, which is also not very realistic, biologically speaking. Um, okay, but even in this context where I'm making my life easy, uh, my goal now is I've simulated 150 samples from this model, and now I'm observing the 150 samples, so I have the, the Y's and the X's, uh, and I want to find which of the features were those that were causal? Um, so the first thing you do, um, if you're a geneticist, uh, you do t-tests of association between each of the features and the outcome. Um, so this means for each of the features, so you have a thousand features, I'm going to run a thousand tests. I'm fitting a linear model that explains the phenotype, the outcome, as a, combina as a linear function of this feature. And I'm testing whether this coefficient here is non-zero. Uh, so it's fairly simple statistical testing. Uh, and what I get on my simulation is the following uh, plot. So here I still have my thousand features. And what you see on the y-axis is minus log 10 of the p-value of the statistical test. Um, so a small p-value is a large minus log 10. And I've drawn a line here uh, at, so, uh, for it's a threshold for statistical significance. <laughs> so if I choose a statistical a threshold for significance at 5%, uh, so the famous p lower than 0.05, uh, because I'm running a thousand tests, I need to correct for multiple hypotheses, and here I'm doing it in the most simple way. Uh, I'm doing a bond for any correction, so it means that uh, instead of alpha, I have alpha divided by 1,000 as a significance threshold. So what you see uh, is um, so, uh, the color code is the same as on my uh, actual sim uh, simulation. Um, so the features that were causal in my model, they are in orange and the others are in blue. So what you see is that I've captured one feature that's above significance mm -hmm. threshold. Uh, and this one was indeed a causal feature in my model. And I'm still missing nine features. The second thing I wanted you to observe is that if I take the significance threshold and I lower it because Bonferroni is too conservative, the second feature I'm picking is this one, which was not a causal feature. And what's happening here uh, is that, I mean, this, the reason this happens is because I have more samples, more features, sorry, than samples. Um, because if I have uh, 150 features, but a thousand, 150 samples, sorry, but a thousand features, what's going to happen is that I'm going to have spurious correlations between my features. So they're not correlated, uh, they're not actually correlated because I've drawn them independently from the, each other. Uh, but because I have, if you take one particular feature, I only have 150 measurements, there's the samples. Uh, then if I do that a thousand times, I'm going to have correlations that appear. And this is why <laughs> Uh, features that appear to be correlated with actually causal features are going to uh, pop up, uh, but they are not uh, actually the one I was looking for. You're still with me? Okay. Um, okay, so this is a bit disappointing. This is what people do in GWAS. Uh, so GWAS, uh, I don't know if you all know what GWAS are, GWAS stands for Genome-Wide Association Studies, and it's exactly the context I've described uh, in the specific case where the measurements are SNPs. So SNPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms, they're illustrated on this picture here. It's the places in the genome where the majority of the population has one allele and the rest of the population has another allele, and those are I mean, we've identified, I don't know, 10 million SNPs uh, in the human genome, and you can build chips to measure cheap or relatively cheap uh, for a given sample, whether the major or the minor allele is present uh, in your sample. 
that's a, just a tad more, a little bit more complicated than that because you have two strains uh, of DNA, but one from your father, one from your mother. So you actually have three possible genotypes, homozygous in the minor allele, homozygous in the major allele, and heterozygous. So people typically encode SNPs uh, as numbers that are either zero, one, or two. Uh, so this number is the number of minor alleles at this uh, locus. So again, it can be homozygous in the major allele, which is the most frequent, homozygous in the minor allele, or heterozygous. Um, okay, and your outcome can be, uh, for, uh, I mean, it can be anything you want, but let's say that it's either going to be minus one, one if you're in a case control study, or a real valued if you're studying a continuous phenotype. Um, okay. So uh, here is an example I'm drawing from a real GWAS. We run on a breast cancer susceptibility data set. Uh, this plot here is the same as the one I've presented you in my simulation before. It's called a Manhattan plot uh, because you have peaks that correspond to like buildings in the Manhattan, Manhattan skyline that corresponds to regions with uh, small p-values. So the reason why you get peaks and not, I mean, sometimes you get a single points that uh, has a, a low p-value, but what you expect is that you will get, like here or like here, uh, a bunch of uh, small p-values next to each other because the SNPs are correlated to each other along the sequence. Um, okay, so this is uh, such an example. Here you have the line for Bonferroni correction, and you have uh, two genes, two regions that pop out, and uh, they turn out to be uh, in coding regions, a genes, uh, they're already known to be associated to breast cancer susceptibility, so you're not discovering anything new, but at least you're not, uh, you're not completely uh, doing something completely weird. Um, okay, but again, if you look back at my previous plot, it's very likely that inside those peaks, there's some interesting signal. And you can't access it just with the classical statistical test. Okay, uh, so this is one of the reasons behind uh, this whole missing heritability uh, uh, concept that's uh, around GWAS. So GWAS are like maybe 15 years old now, and uh, there was a lot of excitement about GWAS first. Uh, and then uh, people started realizing that they weren't giving them the results they were expecting to start with, and then uh, so you can fight with people who are doing not doing GWAS and between people who are doing GWAS and people who think that GWAS is useless and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so this missing heritability is the fact that, uh, so you can estimate heritability of a complex trait, uh, that's in itself a complex thing, but you can do it. And then you can run a GWAS and you can combine the SNPs you've detected in your GWAS and see uh, how much of the variability of the phenotype you explain with that. And then you have a gap between the two. Um, and this gap is the missing heritability. There's many, many reasons why, including possible misestimation of the heritability, non-genetic factors, so all that what's environmental, uh, or factors that are linked to the genome but that are not SNPs, so methylation, for instance. Um, rare SNPs that you're not taking into account, weak effect sizes, um, heterogeneity of the phenotype in which so you've pulled all your breast cancer people uh, samples in the same data set, but it turns out they don't have the same type of breast cancer, so uh, they don't have the same reasons for it. They have the same phenotype, they have tumors in the breast, but they don't have the same causes for this phenotype, uh, so uh, you're trying to find common factors between things that don't have a common factor. Uh, and the reasons I want to talk about, the statistical reasons that they have few samples in high dimension. And going back to uh, my little simulation at the beginning, yes? So it's a question about the heterogeneity of the phenotype, because I've seen many recent GWAS of, on the other way around, they try to combine different diseases to try to pop out some genes that could be like all the mental uh, illness for missing, putting them together. 
Yeah, so you, I mean, if you're looking for, yeah, so there's this assumption that some genes are, have like this pleiotropic effect, they have an effect of multiple different uh, uh, traits, in which case uh, you can pull your GWs together and you can even like do it the other way around, do what people call the FIWAS, in which you're trying to identify, you have a bunch of phenotypes and you're trying to identify which of those phenotypes are associated with this particular SNP or gene. Um, but on the other way, so this is, uh, I mean, it's not absurd to imagine that you have uh, some region of the genomes that are linked to a bunch of, uh, I don't know, immunity-related phenotypes, for instance. On the other hand, uh, well, if you think about breast cancer, for instance, you have like uh, breast cancers that appear because uh, of an overexpression of a particular uh, estro estrogen receptor or because you have an overexpression of another gene or none of the other expression of the three main uh, receptors that are known to be linked to breast cancer. So if you put all of those in the same data set, well, maybe you're just like mixing signals. So that's part of what make, <laughs> making this complex. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so the, the first thing you may think of about this, uh, this simulation I've run was that I simulated a phenotype that was a linear combination of uh, SNPs, of features. Um, and then I did individual SNP per SNP testing. Uh, so maybe I would have been better off trying to fit a linear regression between uh, my outcome and, uh, and my uh, features. So fitting a linear regression means that now I'm learning a model in which I'm using all the features uh, together in a linear combination. Um, okay, so this is one possible solution. So what happens with linear regression if you have more features and samples is that you have an infinity uh, of solutions. Uh, it's equivalent to trying to solve a system of linear equations where you have uh, more equations, more unknowns than equations, so uh, you have an infinity of possible solutions. So this is one solution you can get on this data I've simulated. Uh, the dashed line here don't mean anything, uh, they just help uh, for me at least visualizing what are the like largest values. Um, okay, so several observations here. So the first one is, no, you don't recover your causal features. You have those two SNPs here that have been picked. If you look at the uh, features that have the largest coefficient in your, in your linear regression, uh, but uh, here you have things that have an absolute value, pretty large coefficients that were non-causal. You have things that were causal that have very small coefficient. And the second observation is that is the scale here of the regression weights. They're all very small. So on my initial simulation, maybe I can go back to it. Uh, it was here. So the, the non-zero weights were between 0.1 and 0.3. And if I go back to my uh, linear regression here, almost everything is smaller than 0.025. So really the signal has been spread out uh, over all the features and again, it's because of those spurious correlations between uh, the, uh, the, the features. Uh, again, if I was running the simulation uh, with uh, more uh, samples and features, first of all, I would have a unique solution, and second of all, given that I've used very small uh, noise, I would have the right answer. I would find large weights on my uh, causal features and very small weights on my non-causal features. But here it doesn't work. Um, okay, so what's, what this implies is also linked to uh, the problem of um, stability of molecular signatures. Uh, because if this happens because of all the correlations between the features and because I have an infinity of solutions here, it means that I'm, I'm running it again uh, and I'll get a different answer. And then if I get a different answer, it's really hard to go back uh, to my collaborators and tell them this gene popped up with a large coefficient in the re my linear regression. It must be involved in the phenotype if when I run it again, it doesn't pop up again. Um, so 
The, the concept of uh, stability is this idea that if you're running an experiment several times, or if you're running the same kind of experiments on slightly different data sets, you should get the same answers. And an example uh, of a case where this does not happen is uh, this uh, so molecular signature for predicting the apparition of distant metastasis in uh, breast cancer. So uh, this is something people were starting with doing a lot in uh, the early 2000s was gene expression data. So you had gene expression for a number of samples and then you had uh, good prognosis or bad prognosis. And then you wanted to see if you were able to predict prognosis from your gene expression data. Um, so there's two papers that came out uh, uh, shortly one after the other. The first one in 2001 uh, by Serli et al, a signature of 456 genes predicting uh, this phenotype. And uh, in 2002, a paper by Ventver et al, a signature of 70 genes. Um, those two have about the same predictive power, so they have the same performance in predicting whether you're relapsing or not. They have an overlap of 17 genes. Uh, so you can't, so people had started looking into what were those 456 genes or what were those 70 genes that were predicted of breast cancer, of response, or prognosis, sorry, in breast cancer, uh, trying to, I mean, thinking that, okay, if these, those are predictive, then I can like, try to interpret them and like go back and see in which pathway they are, they are and this type of thing, and maybe this will help us understand the biology of, of breast cancer. Um, and then when people started realizing there were very small little overlap between those two signatures, uh, they stopped doing that a little bit. Okay, so the reason why there's such a small overlap is because there's correlations between all those genes for two reasons, the first one is that you don't have enough samples to measure, uh, to really measure the different features uh, without having spurious correlations appearing. And the second one being that gene expressions are correlated uh, because genes regulate other genes, they belong to the same signaling pathways, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's really hard to identify whether it's this gene that should go into your model or this other gene that is correlated to it. Uh, there's a paper that came out in 2011 that shows that if you take random signatures of 70 genes, um, well, you can predict as well or better than many of the published breast cancer uh, prognosis signatures. So it's not, uh, I mean, <laughs> it looks like a nightmare. It's a nightmare in terms of interpreting the signature. It's not in terms of predictive power because they do have this predictive power, they do actually work. And one of the signature was turned into a companion test, that's called Mamaprint, that is used in the clinics uh, in the US and in several countries in Europe uh, to, to predict um, uh, pr prognosis and to decide whether you should have chemotherapy in addition to uh, surgery. And and it works. I mean, it's used because there have been clinical trials uh, that have shown that it has indeed a good predictive power. It's just that because of all those correlations, uh, you can't say the 70 genes that are in mammoprint are uh, those that drive uh, breast cancer relapse. Um, okay. So uh, what I want to talk about uh, is how can we uh, try to help and uh, by integrating prior knowledge into this type of studies. Okay, so the idea of integrating prior knowledge is uh, if I have several possible solutions to my linear regression, for instance, can I pick one that is most consistent with previously uh, established uh, uh, biological knowledge? Uh, so, the, so, so as to, I mean, I'm hoping that if I do that, then the solution I have is closer to the biology than one that's just correlated with that one. And I'm hoping to, so in this way, to increase uh, interpretability uh, of, uh, uh, of the signature I've found. Uh, so prior knowledge can be represented uh, as many things, but uh, today I'm here to talk about prior knowledge being represented as networks. Um, 
And uh, I'm sure uh, you've already had uh, a bunch of uh, things about uh, biological networks being linked to disease. Uh, but the idea here is that if instead of like just looking for features that explain my phenotype, I can find features that explain my phenotype and that are connected on a biological network, one that I, I already have, then maybe this second solution is more interpretable and closer, closer to the real biology. Um, okay, I don't think I need to go to explain what a biological network is. Probably not at this stage of the week. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that there's a bunch of work on how biological networks can help uh, interpret uh, disease. And the idea is that, well, if instead of looking at your SNPs, for instance, uh, uh, or whatever mutation you're looking at, just independently from each other, biological network helps you give context to those mutations uh, and it helps you highlight multiple ways of arriving at the same results, the same phenotype. Uh, okay, and there's a strong hypothesis that genes that are involved in a disease uh, tend to interact with each other rather than being uh, completely independent from each other in the, at random places in the genome. So that's what we're going to work with now. Okay, so again, what I want to do now is what I call network guided GWAS or network guided biomarker discovery. So now I want to do feature selection as I've done before. So I was just, before I was running a t-test or looking at features that high, had uh, high weights in linear regression. Uh, now I want to do that, but also in such a way that my features, they're compatible with a given network structure. So instead of being anywhere in the genome, they would form a connected subnetwork on my given <laughs> biological network. Okay. Um, so there's a bunch of methods that have been proposed over the years to do that. Uh, and most of them start from this first step, uh, mapping SNPs to genes according to genomic position. Um, okay, so because the problem with that whole idea when you want to do GWAS is that the type of biological entities on which we have a lot of networks, they're genes or proteins. Uh, but when you're looking at the SNPs of all, you don't really have networks over SNPs interacting with other SNPs and those type of things. Uh, so you need to uh, go from the SNPs to the genes uh, if you want to use the gene network. So the classical way of doing this is you say if this SNP is in a gene, well, I'm saying that it's mapped to that gene. Uh, then the problem with doing that is that I think 90% of SNPs or thereabouts are non-coding regions. Uh, so, which means you discard 90% of your data. Uh, so one way of addressing this to some extent is to uh, take a window around your gene uh, with a hypothesis that a SNP that's close to a gene, even if it's in a non-coding region, might have an effect in this, on this gene through a cis-regulatory effect. Um, okay, so if you do this, you're still going to have uh, SNPs that are I mean, unless you take very, very large windows, you're still going to have SNPs that are in, not associated with any gene that you're discarding, but you're going to uh, discard less of your data sets than 90%. Um, okay, then you need a tool to combine SNP p-values into gene p-values. Uh, there's a number of ways uh, of doing that, and I don't really want to, uh, to go into those details. I have a few references for methods if you're interested. Uh, and then the idea is you want to find so now on your uh, favorite gene-gene interaction network, you can ha associate to each gene, each node, a score. So that is this gene p-value. And then you want to find some networks with a lot of small p-values. Uh, so this relies uh, sort of heavily on this guilt by association uh, assumption, uh, which is illustrated here. So here, so here the greener uh, the node, so this is a figure I've lifted from this paper. The greener the node, uh, the more, the stronger the signal for association. If you were to be in that situation where you have strong signal on A, B, and C, and, small, and not a very strong signal on D, uh, because D is strongly connected, is connected to all the thing, uh, you would want your method to also associate D with, uh, with the phenotype. Um, okay, so, so there's a bunch of ways of doing that. 
so as I was saying, a great in p-values, there's several methods. I think the most popular at the moment are Vegas or Magma. Uh, and then there's a bunch of methods who do that. So find high scoring modules. So once I've built my gene-gene interaction networks with scores at each gene, finding subnetworks with uh, low p-values or high scores if you've transformed them into z-scores. There's a bunch of methods that do that. And I'm not here to advocate for any of those methods in particular, because those methods, they make different assumptions about what it means to be a subnetwork that is, uh, that has lots of small p-values, if you want. Um, and I have no notion of which, if any, of those methods is the most valid biologically, uh, but what I want to uh, stress is that they're going to give you different results. Uh, so for instance, Lean is focusing on star sum networks, so it's only looking for modules where you have one node and its neighbors. Uh, so it's all, of course not going to find the same results as a method that is looking for any type of set network. Um, okay. Um, do I want to go into the detail of DNG with? Maybe not. Uh, okay, let me summarize DMG was. Uh, so I've called it here greedy seed and extend a heuristic. The idea of DMG was is that, so you're going to consider each of your genes in your network as a seed, and then you're going to try to grow from the seed. So you're going to evaluate, okay, I'm this gene, uh, I have this uh, p-value or this z-score. Uh, if I grab this, my first name, one of my neighbors, does it increase my z-score, or does it, uh, uh, well, what's the p-value I get? If I also add this neighbor, what's the p-value I get, and so on and so forth. And then maybe you can go to the, net, the neighbors of your neighbors, and you grow in that way. You don't go very far. Uh, then you do that for every single node. So every node in your network uh, grows its little subnetwork of uh, things that allow it to uh, increase its, uh, lower its p-value. Uh, and then you combine uh, networks that bump into each other, if you want. Uh, so it's a heuristic in the sense that there is no guarantee that if you do that, you end up with uh, the uh, subnetwork with the smallest p-value uh, that's possible, but doing this is an NP-hard problem, so you do have to rely on heuristics. Um, okay, one thing I wanted to emphasize, and sorry, this plot is small, about DMG was, uh, is that it does have parameters, and like what uh, some people believe when they run it without looking at the documentation, uh, which are in particular the number of neighbor of uh, so um, the de the depths of neighbors you look at. So are you looking only at your uh, neighbors, or are you also looking at the neighbors of those neighbors, and so on and so forth? And also, when do you stop growing? You need a threshold to decide that you are increasing your z-score or not. And what I wanted to show uh, is that, so this is a simulation, uh, it's not the same as the one before because I didn't run them at the same time, so it's not exactly the same, but it's really the same concept. Um, and here, so what I've done is that my SNPs, so I still have a thousand SNPs, they belong to 200 genes, so each SNP, each, uh, I've made groups of, uh, so, uh, five uh, SNPs, uh, each group of five uh, SNPs is a gene, uh, the genes are connected on a, on a, a simulated network, small network. Uh, and so what I've simulated was that I had a number of genes that were the true genes that were connected on this network, they were forming a module. Uh, so the first thing here, so those, the line at the bottom, I hope you can see the dots, those are the true genes. So, so the one that I simulated is causal. Uh, if I do a single SNP GWAS, I pick up, so as before, the the genes I pick up, they are real. Uh, well, no, no, this one is not real. <laughs> but I picked up two real genes. Uh, and I'm missing a bunch of signal, and I have this one that's actually spurious. I just wanted to show that DMG was you get, depending on the parameters, you get different answers. Uh, so there's some genes that appear to be easier to find than the others, in particular those that were found by this like, classical t-test. And uh, there's some regions here or here where you uh, you find genes that you shouldn't be finding. And, and uh, mostly just 
you know, you get different answer with different parameters. And there's no really good way of deciding that you favor the solution over the solution, um, except for like, looking at it and saying, oh, I like that one better. Um, I'm, I'm singling out DMG was here, but this is true of most methods, right? I just don't want to, uh, uh, I, I don't want to pick on a method. I just want to highlight that. Uh, it's true of most bioinformatics tools, I guess. Okay. Um, so this is uh, another way of illustrating my point about those different methods making different assumptions. We ran those methods on the same data I've presented the Manhattan plot on before. Uh, and you do see, so one of the missions I mentioned, mentioned before was Lean. Lean didn't find any uh, star sub network associated with uh, the phenotype, so I discarded it. You see that you get different, very different solutions. So Heinz is very conservative and only find four nodes, but they are all connected to each other. Uh, DMG was, uh, has like this sort of hub and then like it spreads out. Hotnet 2 gives you more like, I mean, there's a few hubs, but it tends to be like small connected components. Uh, Sigmod is a bit of mix in between both. Uh, so those are the type of results you get. So you use a different tool, you get a different answer. Uh, that's what happens, right? Um, another way of uh, looking at this is, uh, so this is a Manhattan plot I showed you before, uh, except that now I'm plotting it at the gene level and not at the SNP level. Uh, so what I'm doing here is that I've colored in black, well, I didn't do it, but uh, Hector Clemente, with whom I worked on that, did it. He colored in black um, all the genes that are uh, found on this uh, on those networks. So what you see is that like, you get a uh, very different type of solution. So SIGMUT tends to not pick uh, genes with uh, very large p-values. And GMG was is all over the place, HotNet2 as well. Uh, well, Heinz still only finds only four genes. Uh, but it's another way of looking at the data and seeing that the solutions are all very different. Um, OK. So I'm going to pause this for a while. I'll come back to it. Uh, and uh, tell you about uh, a tool in statistics and machine learning that's called regularization. And that is uh, one way of uh, incorporating prior knowledge uh, into uh, statistical models. How many people here have heard about regularization before? Okay. <laughs> Maybe some people have heard about the lasso and don't know that it's called regularization. Uh, a few more. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so the idea of regularization um, is uh, that it's a way again of it's a way of constraining uh, your your solution. Okay. So what I'm showing here, um, uh, so far, what you have here uh, with a bunch of symbols, it's um, a just the regular linear regression fitting. So it's the ordinary least square. Uh, it's the thing we've done how to do since Gauss and Jean, depending <laughs> on if you're more German or French. Um, the, uh, the way you, find, you fit a linear regression is that uh, you find the coefficients uh, W that such that the different you so as to minimize the sum of the squares of the differences between the, the true label, the true outcome, and the prediction. So this is your prediction. This is a true label. You square it, and you sum this over all your samples. And the linear regression finds the weights that minimize this loss. Yeah. Uh, um, it's. That's, uh, I mean, I used to, I'm more used to call it energy, but I'm not, uh, just if someone knows. Uh, uh, okay. Sorry, no, I'm not, not much used to, to information theory type of things. Sorry? It's not, okay. <laughs> 
it's a likelihood, it's an energy, it's an error, it's a risk, uh, it's many different things depending on which field you come from, which means it could have been an entropy coming from a <laughs> different viewpoint. <laughs> Um, from the, if you're, yeah, from the machine learning point of view, it's a risk. So it's the error you're making by uh, predicting your outcomes with this uh, formula. Um, okay, so this is uh, looking for needle in a, in a field. If you want, um, allowing when I'm doing that, my coefficient, my regression coefficient, W, uh, they can be anywhere in RP, so they can, each of them can take any value between minus infinity and plus infinity. Regularization, what it's doing, it's, I'm writing it in a very generic way, it's going to constrain those coefficients uh, in such a way that instead of being anywhere, they have to be restricted to a particular region of space. Uh, so I'm still looking for a needle in a haystack, but it's a bit better than the previous solution. Um, okay. One common here is there's this coefficient here that's called, that's called, that's, I wrote as lambda, it's called the regularization coefficient. And it controls uh, the relative importance of respecting your constraint and uh, minimizing your error or loss. Uh, so there's different ways of setting this uh, coefficient. The most uh, generic and classical one and used in practice is uh, by cross-validation, so you give yourself a range of values for lambda, um, and then you take your, so your whole sample, you split it in, so here I'm split it in, splitting it in five bins, and I'm going to use each of those bin in turn as a test set, and I'm going to learn my model with one particular value of lambda on this part of the data, and check how it performs here, do the same on those four blocks, check how it performs here. I get, so I do it five times, I get an average performance uh, for each of my values of lambda, and then I can say, okay, this particular value of lambda gave me uh, the best uh, model, so it's the one I'm keeping. I can retrain my, uh, my model with this value of lambda on the entire, uh, on the entire training set. Uh, okay, so uh, let's give an example of regularization. Uh, so I'm going to use regularization to encode prior knowledge in, or hypothesis. And here, the prior knowledge or hypothesis I'm encoding is that relatively few features are important. So I don't want to have to use the entire genome to explain my phenotype. I would like to use only a few SNPs. So the way to do that is what people call the lasso. It's to use as a regularizer the sum of the absolute values of the coefficients. Uh, for uh, geometrical reasons that maybe I'm not going to get into, uh, if you do that, so yeah, maybe uh, a first comment, uh, you see that if you have lots of WGs that are equal to zero, this term is going to be small. Uh, and so this is actually what it's, what this term is doing. It's going to force a number of uh, regression coefficients to be exactly equal to zero. Another comment I may, could have made when I've, we were talking about lambda is that if lambda is small, close to zero, uh, you don't care about your constraint and you're fitting your classical linear regression. If lambda is very large, the only term that's going to matter is this one. Uh, so in this case, if lambda is very large, uh, you're not going to care about minimizing the error, you're only going to care about minimizing the sum of the absolute value of the coefficients, so you're going to obtain coefficients that are all equal to zero. So you're going to respect your constraint very well, uh, you're going to select no features, and you're going to have a completely useless model. Uh, so hence the importance of uh, choosing lambda wisely. Um, okay. So, uh, uh, LASSO stands for, let's hope I'm not messing it up, uh, least absolute uh, square, selective operator. There's a least absolute because of this, O for operator, S is, oh, sparse selection operator. 
Uh, so what? So people, when you talk about the lasso, you talk about sparsity, which is this idea that many features will have a weight of zero. So the solution is parsimonious. And then you can consider that only the features that have a non-zero weight are the ones that are selected. Okay. Uh, how does this work on my simulation? A bit better. Uh, so this is the same, same simulation as uh, I started with. Uh, so now you see that uh, the value of my regression weights are closer to the initial ones in my model. So there now we're uh, again between 0 and 0 0.3. Um, you see that you have few features that are selected. Indeed, most of them had a weight of zero. You still see that some of the features that have non-zero weights were not causal, and here, two of the features that were causal were not selected. Uh, but we're moving towards uh, something. Okay. Uh, going back to stability, Lasso has a big drawback. It's very unstable. Um, if you have correlated features, and again, biology, your features are going to be correlated. Fewer samples and features, your features are going to be correlated. In essence, the way you can see it is that if you have two strongly correlated features, the lasso is going to randomly pick only one of them, where, where the linear regression would kind of like spread the weight between the two features. So the lasso is only going to pick one of them randomly. So meaning you run the lasso again, it's going to pick the other one. Uh, so, which is what I wrote here. So if you run it several times, even on the same data set, you get different results. So if you run it several times on, on different related data sets, you're going to get entirely different feature sets explaining your phenotype. Uh, so there's two ways to uh, address this issue or limit <laughs> the problem if you want. One is called elastic net. So the idea is that instead of just doing, uh, here's the lasso, you're just using the lasso as a regularizer, you combine it with this regularizer. Uh, so it's still, I mean, you still see that this term is small when lots of wj are equal to zero. Um, but this has the effect that if you have several correlated features, it's going to pick all of them and spread the weight, share the weight evenly uh, between them. So you'll end up with a set of features that is larger, but, but more stable. Uh, I mean, there's no way, <laughs> if you have correlated features, there's no way of, mm, I mean, here in this, in this case, the only way of being uh, more stable is by picking all the correlated features, and then you pick them every time. Um, there's another way of addressing the, this, which we can combine with the elastic net. Uh, it's called stability selection for the lasso. Uh, the idea is to repeat on multiple, the, this, uh, this optimization thing, so repeat the lasso on multiple bootstrap sample on the data. So uh, bootstrap sample is when you, uh, you pick uh, as many samples as you had in, originally in your data set, uh, but with replacement, which means you're going to pick some of the samples several times and some never, so this creates a sub subset of, uh, of your samples. And then you have a procedure to keep only the features that are uh, selected often uh, with the idea that, okay, this feature was selected in 90% uh, of my bootstraps, so that's probably meaningful. Okay. Uh, let's have another small uh, interruption to talk about p-values. Uh, so, I don't know about your different, different respective fields, but when you work in DWIS, people want p-values. So, not particularly that set against p-values. Uh, I just wanted to take this opportunity to, uh, you know, maybe something, this is still something that you should wonder about. Do you really want a p-value? Um, and I think, it, I think it's important to remind you of what a p-value is. A p-value is a probability that the value you observe, uh, well, that it's a probability of observing something as extreme as this value under the null hypothesis. Uh, so it's informative. Uh, it's not magic. It's not like a magic wand that if it's lower than 0.05, you can publish, and if it's not, you can't publish. Um, I've put a bunch of references in the slide uh, if you want to dig uh, larger uh, in this question, but there's things from the American uh, Statistical Associations and so on and so forth about p-values. Um, okay, <laughs> what I wanted to say was that 
as soon as you start doing something a bit more complicated than the statistical tests, like simple univariate statistical tests, it starts getting harder to get p-values. Uh, so it's actually possible to get mm -hmm. p-values for the lasso. Uh, so there's, it's something very recent. I mean, the lasso uh, was proposed in 93, 94. Uh, getting p-values for those regression coefficients in the lasso, I mean, for like, is it significant that I picked this feature? Uh, is something we've known how to do, like the first paper, 2014, and the second one, 2016. This one is a bit more uh, computationally efficient than the first one. Uh, so it's uh, very recent things. Um, but it's possible at the expense of some additional computational cost, knowing that you've uh, already spent some, quite some computational cost finding the correct value for lambda. Uh, okay, that aside, let's go back to networks because that's what we were here to discuss. Um, okay, so what I want to show here is that it's possible to uh, use regularization to uh, uh, encode constraints that are a bit more complex than just uh, sparsity. And here, uh, one of the things you can do is you can write a constraint, so from uh, your uh, biological network, uh, you can write a constraint that's going to say that um, uh, there's not much variation between the regression coefficients on connected nodes. So meaning that a node that's not selected has a regression coefficient of zero, its neighbors will most likely also not be selected or they have very small weights, whereas a, a node that is surrounded by nodes with high uh, weights will also get a high weight. Uh, so mathematically you can do this uh, by writing this constraint. We depend on the graph Laplacian, so you know, do, does everybody know what a graph Laplacian is? No. Does everybody know what an adjacency matrix is? <laughs> adjacency matrix. Okay, so if you have a network, you can represent it uh, by a matrix that has as many rows and columns as the number of nodes, and each entry is one or a coefficient if the two nodes, uh, the one on the row and the one on the column, are connected and zero otherwise. The graph Laplacian is a small transformation of this. Uh, I didn't write the equation. Uh, you, you get it very simply from uh, the adjacency matrix by subtracting the degree matrix. So it's, uh, uh, it's a very simple thing to build. Um, and it's, uh, it is analogous to Laplacians in, uh, uh, how do you say it, functional analysis. Uh, that uh, quantifies the variation of a function. It can be used to uh, measure the variation on a graph. Um, and so again, this constraint here uh, enforces that the weights vary smoothly on the network. Um, yeah. Oh, you're here. Okay, yes. Yes. The degree, yeah. Uh, it's probably is by asking you towards selecting hubs, like yeah, most by like, most methods with biological networks, I would say. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd be weighted by the degree. That is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, well, it's going to bias you towards selecting hubs. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if there's an easy way to uh, exclude uh, the, uh, I mean, exclude from the second sum J, but I'm not sure actually. But may, uh, yeah, I mean, it's always the same question with hubs, right? Are you? Are you happy to select hubs or are you unhappy to select hubs? Yeah. And so you Yeah. Uh, but that's a good point. Okay, so this is how it works. On, oh, sorry, yes.
Uh, so that's a good question. Uh, so could we uh, have to like sit down, write the math, and see whether you can solve this problem if you put something else in here? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, this is one of the ways where we know how to solve the problem, the optimization problem here. Okay, so what I had hidden from you from the start was that in my original simulations, the 10 causal features were connected on the network I had simulated. And when I apply my network constraint lasso to this, uh, I do get this solution here where uh, most of my causal features have large weights. I mean, all my causal features have large weights and my non-causal features have weights that are close to zero. Um, yes, one comment here is that if the network is unrelated to the problem, so if I'm running the same simulation, uh, but I'm using a network on which the future are not uh, are not connected. Uh, it's just going to I mean it's not going to help, right? I mean you're supposing that your prior knowledge is helpful. Yeah, uh, Hervé. <laughs> well, what is the network information you have Sorry, the network information on. Um, so some are connected, some are not, some are connected to the orange ones. Um, I, don't, I, should have, I should include a picture of the network here, I guess. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm, in, I'm trying to remember what I simulated, but I know I simulated a smaller network, uh, and then I picked one, I mean, I picked one node to be the first causal feature, and then I moved uh, towards nodes that were connected uh, to this one, or to other nodes that were in my 10 causal features. Uh, so, there are connections between the other features, there are connections between some of the causal features and some uh, non-causal features. Yeah, Mathieu, please. No, no, I was going to ask whether you had a core. It's not a hub, it's not a core node with its neighbors. It's, uh, it's a small connected component. You had some nodes in the network. Yeah, of course, <laughs> always. Um, okay. Um, let me, well, I, I was saying yesterday that I had spent time checking that my slides were in order, but now I'm realizing that maybe not. Um, so here, um, I'm still working at the gene level. So maybe I've combined my SNP p-values into a gene p-value, uh, but the networks I'm working with, the networks on genes. Um, so I can run this type of methods on networks with tens of thousands of nodes. What I cannot do is if I had a network over SNPs with hundreds of thousands of nodes, I cannot uh, run this type of method that's just computationally too intensive. Well, I may be lying because I started worrying about this in 2012 and so maybe now <laughs> it actually would be possible. Um, but when we started thinking about that, it's just like, uh, I mean, we just were not able to run uh, those methods on SNP networks. So maybe what's out of order is that how do you actually build a network between SNPs? So here I'm just showing a few things you can do. Uh, if you have um, um, SNP data, uh, the easiest thing you can think about is to just give a linear structure to your network. So you say I'm connecting a SNP to the SNP that's before it and the SNP that's after it on the genetic sequence. It actually builds a network. It doesn't contain uh, much uh, prior information, but finding uh, some networks of these networks that are uh, like finding connected components of this network is finding regions of adjacent genes, of adjacent SNPs. Uh, once you can go maybe one step further and say uh, if SNPs two, three, and four and five are, I mean, three and four are inside the gene, two and five are a bit before, a bit after. I could connect all those uh, SNPs together. And probably the most interesting you can do is if you have a gene-gene interaction networks that tells you that gene one and gene two are connected to each other, 
you can build the SNP SNP interaction networks in which you connect its SNPs that's mapped to G1 to each SNP that's mapped to E2. Uh, so you create this type of networks. Um, is, you can imagine a bunch of different, uh, I mean, can imagine other ways of connecting SNPs to genes or SNPs between each other, in particular now that we're starting to have uh, chromatin contact data, you could say that two SNPs are connected on your network if they're uh, in contact uh, in the cell. Um, you could imagine many things. I'm talking here more from a like, methodological point of view. What do you do once you've built such a network? And that you have a networks with hundreds of thousands of nodes and you want to perform feature selection directly on your GWS data. You don't want to like combine p-values of SNPs and p-values of genes. You want to work directly on this data and this network. So one thing we proposed uh, is, uh, okay, so we were not able to run uh, the network guide lasso I presented before. So what we thought of, uh, was um, to formulate the problem a bit differently and saying um, we don't really care about those regression coefficients, right? I mean, those that are non-zero, I don't care about their values. So I just want to know whether for each step, whether it's selected or not. Um, so this allows me to formulate the problem uh, in, uh, uh, in a combinatorial way, if you want. So instead of looking for each SNP, but what should be its coefficient, I'm looking at whether it's selected or not. Uh, so you have, I have my set V of P SNPs. I want to find a subset of SNPs, a uh, subset of the set. Uh, and then I can do something that's uh, similar to the uh, regularization of the linear regression. I can say I want that their, their relevance for the phenotype is maximized. So you can think of using a Z score, for instance. Uh, so saying the relevance of set S is a sum of the Z scores of this of the SNPs in set S. Uh, but I also want to uh, enforce some constraints here. Uh, so for instance, I can enforce sparsity by saying, well, I want to maximize the relevance, but I also don't want the size of this set S to be too large. So I'm penalizing. Uh, by uh, this size, I still have a coefficient here. And I can also enforce connectivity. So for instance, so here W is my adjacency matrix. And this term, so what this term does is that it counts the number of edges in the networks that are between a node that's selected and a node that is not selected. Um, so if you have a solution that is made of nodes that are like completely randomly placed in the network, you're going to have a lot of uh, disconnections. If you have uh, connected uh, components, uh, you're going to have most of your edges are going to be between a SNP that's not selected and a SNP that's not selected, or between two SNPs that are selected. So this term here, it penalizes solutions that are disconnected. It's very analogous to the uh, network guided lasso. And the difference here is, uh, again, so that the network guided lasso, you, it was an optimization problem in uh, RP. Here is an optimization problem com that's combinatorial. So usually when I start talking about this, people who know about optimization are telling me, wait, you're replacing a convex optimization problem with a combinatorial problem and you're hoping it's going to help. And the answer is yes. <laughs> um, so it's normally, you, I mean, usually you, you do it the other way around. You have a combinatorial problem you want to solve and it's intractable, so you transform it into a convex optimization problem that's going to uh, be uh, faster to solve. Here it turns out that this is a very specific case uh, of a combinatorial problem. It's a min cut problem. And I don't have the slide that shows, uh, that shows it. Um, who knows about graph cuts? One person, two persons, a few, per a few people. Uh, so maybe it's okay that I didn't show uh, the, the equivalent graph cut version. So graph cuts, uh, the idea is you have a graph, uh, there's a node that's a source and that's a node that's a sink, and you want to split the graph in two. Uh, and so connecting some of the nodes to uh, the source and the rest to the sink in uh, such a way that um, 
the uh, so it's equivalent to something that's called max flow. So one way of thinking of it is that um, if uh, each of your edges is a pipe, and if you have weighted edges, you have a larger pipe. If you have a larger weight, if you put water from the source, you want the maximum amount of water to arrive to the sink. Uh, so that's a problem that's uh, very well solved in particular in computer vision. Uh, and there are ways of solving it efficiently, in particular if the network is uh, not very densely connected, which is what we have in biology. Um, and so you can solve this problem very efficiently because you can reformulate it as uh, such a max flow problem. Uh, so this is work we've done in 2012, 2013. It was published in Bioinformatics. Uh, so there's a GitHub with uh, sort of the code of this paper, just a bit more clean. And we also have um, uh, an R package uh, to do this. Uh, the R package is meant to run di directly uh, on GWIS data and also run the optimization of the lambda and eta parameters, just uh, uh, behind the scene if you want. Um, okay, so how does it work on my simulation? Of course, I run, I mean, I've created the simulation so that scones work, at, sorry, it's called scones for selecting connected explanatory steps. Uh, of course, I've run my simulation so that scones work, but I'm happy to report that it does work. Uh, so now you only have, for each feature, you only have zero, it's not selected, one, it's selected, and you see my 10 causal features are selecting, the rest are not selected. Uh, on uh, real data, <laughs> it's a bit of a different story. Um, so here is it's still my breast cancer data from uh, the beginning. What you see here, so those are the three different types of networks I've built. So this one is only being a genetic sequence. So what I was telling you is that it's not using really network information. It can be used for selecting uh, regions of SNPs that are adjacent on the sequence. So that's why you see large bars uh, that are being selected. Uh, this is just gene memberships, so same uh, idea, but you're making more connections between SNPs that are mapped to the same gene. Uh, so you find something that's actually fairly similar between the two. And this is um, the results you obtain when you use uh, the same uh, protein protein interaction network as for the uh, results I've presented before. Uh, so you find regions of the genome that are uh, connected through this interaction network. One comment here is that, uh, so working directly on the SNP networks allows you to capture a region of the genome that are non-coding and that were not included in the other uh, studies because you couldn't map them to, uh, to genes. Uh, and this is a lot of what happens here, actually. I mean, in all of, in all of those. But even with the gene interaction network, you, uh, you and I, maybe I have the plot. Oh no, I didn't include the plot. Uh, but what we found is that uh, you get a lot of intergenic regions that are connected through the genomic sequence to uh, genes that interact with each other. Uh, okay, and this is just a reminder of one of the methods uh, I had presented before that finds solutions that are much more spread out over all the genome. Um, okay, one, so, yeah, again, uh, so what I said before about the um, existing methods uh, for uh, uh, finding um, functional modules from uh, GWIS data still stands. There's no particular reason why my method should be better than the existing methods, nor why any of them should be better. So the one I'm listing are the ones we're able to run on our data, so that's definitely something that makes your methods better than another is if you can, it can be used by other people. <laughs> but aside from that, they all make different mathematical assumptions. Mine also has a different type of mathematical uh, assumption. Um, and so they give different answers. Uh, and I think one way of uh, like moving forward uh, from this point on is to build a consensus network. So we did something very simple with this data. Uh, we uh, kept every node of the protein-protein interaction network that was selected for smarter way to methods. Uh, so there's many more smarter ways of uh, building uh, consensus networks, but that's a simple approach. 
and it's fairly effective. Um, so, so those are the results we obtained. So you see, so in the genes that are in pink were previously associated with femoral breast cancer. Uh, you see that we have a few uh, a few hubs uh, that appear. Uh, so one thing that uh, was interested, I'm sorry, I forgot the name of this gene and it's not written on the plot, but this was a gene that, uh, I mean, in, in our data set, has a very like, uninteresting p-value, uh, but its expression is known to be uh, associated with, uh, with cancer, and I'm not sure if it's breast or ovarian cancer. Uh, so that's some of the interesting things you can, uh, you can get. Um, and yeah, so what I'm showing here is where those uh, genes that appear in the consensus networks are compared to what we're obtaining from the different networks. It's one way of making use of all those different assumptions and uh, combining them. Um, okay, yes. How do you know which ones are relevant? Like if you're comparing the results you get with the different methods, here you don't have a gold standard. So yeah, that's, yeah, you don't have a gold standard. That's one of the major issues of all this feature selection in, uh, problems in, in, uh, in biology. So there's a bunch of things we did on this that I'm not showing here. Uh, but in essence, two ways. One is that this particular study, it's run on a small French cohort of about 2,000 uh, patients. Uh, and one thing we did was comparing our results to a large uh, uh, cohort uh, that's called BCAC, which is it's Caucasian uh, people and with uh, also familial breast cancer. So of course, I mean the reason why people started this uh, small uh, French uh, study is because they think there's some specificities maybe that will appear in the French population. But at the same time, uh, it's uh, uh, it's not absurd to think that we should find things that were found in the larger uh, study. And so one thing we looked at is whether the genes we were picking uh, were uh, significant in the standard uh, GWAS in uh, BCAC in the larger uh, study. And this is uh, to some extent the case. So that's, I mean, that's kind of one of the things you do in GWAS is like you find <laughs> shaky gold standards to compare yourself to. And the other thing we did was we looked at uh, um, uh, so how well using those selected genes, uh, how it performs at predicting at separating cases from control and this type of things. Uh, it turns out it's shit at separating cases from controls in like any any of the methods individually, including just the standard GWAS or less O, or I mean, nothing works for separating cases from control. So it wasn't very informative, but that's the type of things you, you can do. Um, so when we published scones, uh, we worked on um, uh, plant growth, uh, plant data sets where the phenotypes were relating to plant growth. Uh, and that's one of the things we were able to do was comparing like, how well our, uh, so it was a bit easier, the phenotype. Uh, so we were able to, to see how well the SNPs that were picked, uh, how good they were at predicting the phenotypes. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, uh, so maybe I missed a bit something in the, in the network that you choose. Yeah. So you, you mentioned protein protein interaction. Yeah, that's, yeah. So would that be possible to, to use other types of networks? Yeah, definitely. And, and did you try? And, and how do you expect that? To work? So that's one of the things we're exploring at the moment on this data set and another, uh, an IBT data set. Uh, Yes, I mean, if you put a different network in, uh, you're going to get a different <laughs> outcome. So one of the things, so the, the data set we used here, here it's uh, also one of those consensus networks, it's uh, the Hint database. Uh, so what was interesting is that we, we looked at, so in Hint you have uh, two types of interactions. You have uh, confirmed interactions and uh, from screens and those who come from the, that come from the literature. Uh, for some reason, we didn't really get very different results when we were including or excluding the edges from the literature. I'm not really sure what to make of it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So the limitation is going to be more in the number of edges. So, uh, I mean, it runs uh, on, it runs easily on like two million nodes for sure. Uh, and uh, networks that were built from uh, one of those uh, like uh, large <laughs> interaction networks. Um, so if you were to like have 10 times more edges, it would start crashing. Uh, yeah. So when you're doing the network will your event will be the network attack also also the network? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So will your will your also be this one? Or like uh, this sort of method because you have more network so you won't be really So I I I don't know in the sense that uh, I mean, you know, so this here you have three methods, and here you have three methods, but they're not the same three methods. Uh, so again, it's all come back to the fact that these different methods are making different mathematical assumptions, and I don't think there's any reason to believe that biology follows one of those models rather than the other. Um, Okay, I have one more point I wanted to uh, make, but I'll be briefer than the amount of slides I have. Uh, I just wanted to mention um, that, uh, so of course everything I've taught is like, you know, I've said we have like lots of limitations because we don't have enough samples. Uh, and I wanted to mention that uh, there's a way to have more samples, uh, which is not to sequence more people. <laughs> we all know about that one, it's expensive. Uh, <laughs> And not always realistic. Um, it's uh, it's about it's something that we call multitask uh, approaches. So the idea is to combine related uh, data sets. Um, so um, the idea. Let's not look at the equation. Uh, so it can be done on the lasso, for instance. Uh, so the idea is that you're going to create a regularization term. Uh, that's going to uh, be uh, that going to enforce that your different tasks, so your different, so you can think of it like each of those lines, it's uh, one uh, G was data set, uh, and you have good reasons to believe that uh, there should be shared commonalities between uh, those uh, different data sets. Uh, so, for instance, uh, if you have data sets that are quantifying a response to treatment and that you're talking about treatment of the same disease, it's not absurd to think that response to treatment is guided by, uh, by similar genomic regions for the different molecules, but maybe uh, not exactly the same for, uh, for the different treatments, so they don't have the same target and this type of thing. Um, so what the multitask lasso is doing is that instead of solving each of those, looking at each of those data sets individually, you're going to use a regularizer that's coupling uh, the different tasks. And what, so that's what this term is doing. And so you're going to use the same features for all tasks, so which is why I have columns here. And then you can have different weights for each, uh, each of those tasks. So use the same features. But then you can modulate the importance of each of the features, and you could actually end up having like a white uh, box here, having some of the features that are selected across all data sets, but have a weight of zero in a particular data set. Yes? Yeah, that's, a, that's the exact point. Okay. But it would be, it would be the same. Yeah, it would be on the same genotype data. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it has to be on the same genotype data. Um, so I just you know, let's not talk about this, or even though it's interesting, because <laughs> then at some point people are going to want to have coffee. Uh, I just wanted to also state that this can be done on scones. Uh, so now I'm starting to like have to use two lines to write my equations. Uh, but this first line here, this is just, I'm not even using the same notation as before, I'm sorry. But this, what you have here and this between those two parentheses is just salt scones on each individual task. 
So if I'm just doing the first line, what I'm doing is solving scones on each of the individual tasks. This term here, what it's doing is that it's coupling my answers to the different task by uh, penalizing uh, as a function of the symmetric difference between the set of things that are selected. So if I'm selecting the exact same solution for uh, task T and task Q, this term is zero. If my solutions are very different, this term is going to be large. Um, but you have this flexibility of saying, well, it, I'm ready to uh, have a bit of penalization here because I didn't select the same SNPs exactly if it improves uh, relevance for each of the tasks, for instance. Um, okay, you can have multi-task variants of uh, plenty of things. I was just, I just wanted to, to highlight this, so this uh, idea of coupling uh, different G uh, and uh, in which you think, that, so you don't want to treat them as a single data set. I mean, if you're looking at, I don't know, breast and ovarian cancer, you don't want to say, hey, it's all the same cancer. Uh, but you might want to say, look, those are, they share commonalities. Uh, can we look for features uh, by saying that, <laughs> looking at those two together and trying to couple uh, the solutions, okay? Uh, this is just not complicated. Uh, okay, so for instance, if you want to use multi scones, uh, so it, uh, we've shown on, I mean, it's still in the plant data that uh, you do benefit from using multiple related tasks. Also, your solution is more stable. Uh, the drawback is that it only scales to a small number of tasks. Uh, so you can do it if you have three or four related phenotypes. Uh, if you uh, want to uh, do a drug screen where you have a, I mean, you know, you're exposing cell lines to a number of drugs and you want to understand what's driving uh, the response to these drugs, if you have a thousand drugs, this is not going to work. Okay, so I'm going to uh, conclude with that on some of the things we are working on uh, to move on from this. Uh, so, I've mentioned the fact that SNPs are correlated. This is something that's called linkage disequilibrium. Uh, and uh, so you have several solutions to linkage disequilibrium. One is you can prune uh, and keep only, so if you have a, a group of SNPs that are correlated, you only keep one and you only work on this one. It's nice because it decreases your number of features, which is something we want. Uh, on the other hand, you could say that there is signal on each of those SNPs, so you may want to combine them together. Uh, and if you combine them together, who are you? Com I mean, how are you combining them, and who are you combining? Uh, so one of the uh, ideas between scones run on just the linear uh, networks, this linear sequence, was that it was we were hoping it would find blocks on its own. Uh, but this is one of the questions I have about GWAS. Population structure is something I've not addressed, but it's a major concern in GWAS. Uh, I mean, I've talked about uh, heterogeneity of phenotype, uh, but it comes back to that a bit. Uh, if you have uh, in the same data set different uh, populations, they may not have uh, the same uh, genetic causes for the same phenotype. Uh, so there's... Uh, the two like most straightforward ways of dealing with that, I mean, the most straightforward way of dealing with that is to separate your data in homogeneous populations. Uh, now, if you do this, you reduce your number of samples, uh, so it's clean, but it's, uh, you know, you lose statistical power. Uh, what is frequently done is to incorporate populations, so you may know that you can measure population structure by uh, doing principal component analysis on the entire genomes. You can include those principal components as covariates in your models. That's what most people do in, uh, in GWAS. Uh, but what I'm interested in is using those multitask approaches I've presented uh, on the different subpopulation uh, of a data set and see, see where this goes. So this is one of the things we're working on at the moment. Uh, and this is, this is something I was expecting much more questions about from this community. <laughs> I mean, I've had a few. Uh, but like, how do you actually build those SNP, SNP networks? Uh, so, I mean, it's, there's so many possibilities at every level. Like, uh, first, 
are you relying only on SNP to gene mapping, or also do you use SNPs? Well, do you use other ways of saying those two SNPs should be connecting to each connected or yeah, connected to each other? If you use SNP to gene mapping, are you relying only on genomic coordinates? Do you want to incorporate known EQTLs uh, and chromatin contacts? Uh, which gene gene network are you using? Uh, and uh, yeah, so many things. So we're working uh, uh, on this at the moment. Uh, I don't think there's going, I mean, you know, it's not going to be magic. There's not going to be a solution where we say you should do this mapping and use this gene network because that's going to be data set and phenotype dependent, right? Uh, but still at least having the toolbox to, uh, to easily uh, uh, try out all those different possibilities would be a good start. Um, okay, and then I'm done. I was told I was I, I had to like give you a little exam. <laughs> uh, so I think for now I'm only like giving you the questions, uh, and I don't know, Matthew, if you want me to give you the questions again yeah. afterwards. So. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I think this is for tonight. So here I have two questions. Uh, the first one is about GWAS. Uh, so GWAS are doomed because they failed to uncover the genetic basis of all diseases uh, because the same phenotype can be due to uh, many pathways. Uh, big hose is just too many SNPs with respect to the number of samples and we're not getting anywhere. Uh, or maybe GWAS aren't that doomed because as I was saying, we started doing this 15 years ago when 50 years in the big scheme of things isn't that long. Uh, so that's my first question. And my second question, it's, uh, it's a did you pay attention question. <laughs> and it's integrating final and statistical models can be done through regression, regularization, regeneration, or regulation. <laughs> 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 I didn't say, you didn't tell me I had to, add, to ask difficult questions. <laughs> the first one is difficult, okay? I mean, the first one can be like lead to interesting discussions, and I'm not saying there's a right answer to the first one. The second one definitely has a right answer. <laughs> okay, uh, with this, I have a bunch of people to thank uh, with whom I've worked uh, on these topics uh, in particular. Uh, Dominic Grimm, Hicha Suginyama, Yoshinobu Kawahara, and Carson Bogvot, uh, with whom I've worked, uh, I've developed scones. Um, Hector Clemente Gonzalez, uh, who's worked uh, with me since then on applying scones to uh, uh, a number of other phenotypes and uh, developing it, making the R package. Uh, and he's conducted all the work I've shown on this breast cancer data set. Uh, and uh, Victor Berlin and Veronique Stoven uh, have uh, worked on something I didn't, I worked with them on something I skipped, but I still like to thank them. And I'd like to thank you for your attention, and if there's more questions, I'll be happy to take them. <laughs>